The crumpled eviction notice slipped from my fingers, fluttering softly to the polished wood floors. I stared at the offensive piece of paper, bile rising in my throat as I absorbed the callous words. Your continued occupation of the premises is no longer welcomed. Vacate within thirty days, or legal action will be pursued. No name, no explanation, just a cold command typed out on my mother-in-law's letterhead. After twelve years of living in this house, I was being kicked to the curb like yesterday's trash. I shook my head sharply, as if trying to wake myself from this nightmare. But the stark black words on the page remained unchanged. Marlene did this. It had to be her. Ever since I married her precious son Theo five years ago, she had made her disdain for me abundantly clear. In her esteemed opinion, I was too common, too plain, and too barren to be a fitting wife. My fingers curled into fists as hot anger flooded my chest. This went beyond petty grievances with the overbearing matriarch. No, Theo had to be complicit in this scheme to cast me out of my own home. The man I loved and trusted had betrayed me in the worst possible way. Bile continued to rise in my throat as my mind raced over the past few months. The growing distance between Theo and I, the lengthening work hours, the mysterious phone calls he would abruptly end whenever I entered the room. Like puzzle pieces clicking into place, it all started to make horrible sense. I sank down onto the cold marble floors, the eviction notice still glaring relentlessly from where it had landed. Hugo, my tabby cat, nudged his head against my elbow, disturbed by the dark storm clouds gathering around me. I stroked his back reflexively, drawing comfort from his warm, rumbling purr. At least I still had Hugo on my side. That was more than I could say for my traitorous husband and his insidious mother. As I sat there, the twelve years I had spent in this house washed over me like a tide. Theo presenting me with the key the day after our honeymoon, beaming with pride to make me mistress of this magnificent estate. Long summer days lounging by the pool with my friends, glasses of crisp rosé in hand. Curled up with Theo by the crackling fire on winter nights, safe in the circle of his strong arms, I swallowed hard past the lump in my throat. Were all those memories just pretty illusions? Had my marriage to Theo been nothing but an elaborate sham this entire time? The painted walls around me now seemed like a gilded cage, trapping me inside a role I no longer played. Mistress of the manor, lady of the house. Those titles had been ripped away, replaced now with unwelcome occupant. Everything I had known, this house, my marriage, my hopes of starting a family one day, had been built on quicksand. And now I was sinking into an abyss of anger, betrayal, and bone-deep hurt. I rose on wobbly legs, shaking off Hugo's concerned nudges. Padding quietly through the empty halls, I entered my bedroom with trepidation. Theo's smells still lingered. His musky cologne, the peppermint hair gel he used religiously each morning. But for the first time, those familiar scents made my stomach curdle with resentment instead of affection. I sank down on the massive four-poster bed, its plush duvet suddenly feeling frivolous and wasteful. I should have known a marriage crafted from convenience instead of passion could never withstand the tests of time. Theo had needed a polite, presentable wife to silence his mother's complaints. I had needed financial security after my first failed marriage left me penniless. On paper, we made perfect sense. But the contracts of marriage run deeper than what's on paper. They require trust, communication, compromise, all things painfully absent from my relationship with Theo. I rose and began yanking open dresser drawers, no longer caring about the racket I was making. Let them hear what damage their callous actions had wrought. I recklessly swept aside neat stacks of ironed clothing, not even folding them properly in my haste. My hands closed around the fake bottom I had installed in his drawer years ago. Popping it open, I retrieved the flash drive concealed beneath, clutching it tightly. If Theo thought he could discard me so easily, he was sorely mistaken. I was taking this insurance policy with me. I woke with a start, momentarily confused by my unfamiliar surroundings. Rather than the king-size sleigh bed I'd shared with Theo, I was curled up on the lumpy sofa bed in my tiny rental apartment. The previous day came crashing back, the confrontation with Theo over my eviction, my furious packing, his half-hearted excuses about financial difficulties. I had spat back that money seemed plentiful enough for him to afford a fancy new condo for his mistress. Theo's face had drained of color. 
How did you... Who told you that? He sputtered. I found out all on my own, I hissed. I know you've been siphoning money from our accounts for months. Did you really think I wouldn't notice $10,000 a month disappearing? He raked a hand through his hair, refusing to meet my livid gaze. Alara, I swear, she didn't mean anything to me. It was just a stupid fling. Save it, I snapped, clenching my fists so I wouldn't succumb to my urge to slap him. This isn't about her. This is about you lying to my face, betraying our vows, and deceiving me. I turned on my heel, abandoning him to deal with the movers. My departure was satisfyingly dramatic, but my triumph soon faded, replaced by bone-deep hurt and anger. I rose unsteadily from the lumpy couch, my back protesting yesterday's frenzied activity. At least Theo's credit card had been useful for furnishing this depressingly bare apartment. I hoped the $5,000 bill gave him a nice slap in the face. I filled Hugo's food bowl on autopilot, my thoughts churning darkly. How could I have missed all the signs these past few months? Thinking back, it was painfully obvious. Theo's late nights at work, his constant distraction whenever we talked, the locked study I was now barred from entering. An icy sensation trickled down my spine. The locked study. In my hurried packing yesterday, I'd forgotten to retrieve my laptop stashed in there. Cursing under my breath, I grabbed my keys and headed for the door. Time for another unwanted trip to the scene of this betrayal. Maybe I'd accidentally smash something expensive on my way out. Twenty minutes later, I stood outside the formidable wrought iron gates that marked the entrance to what used to be my home. I stared bitterly at the ostentatious double doors and sprawling columns. What a fool I'd been, thinking I belonged behind those gilded walls. Squaring my shoulders, I strode up the winding driveway, stealing myself for another confrontation. Before I could knock, the door was wrenched open abruptly. Marlene's piercing eyes raked over me disdainfully. Well, well. I thought I made myself clear about you not being welcome here anymore, she said coldly. Behind her tailored skirt and silk blouse, I caught a glimpse of suitcases stacked in the foyer. My eyes narrowed. Going somewhere, Marlene? That's none of your concern. State your business and then kindly leave. I crossed my arms. I need to get some personal items from the study. It will just take a moment. Over her shoulder, I noticed Theo descending the curved staircase, his normal polish slightly diminished. His suit was badly wrinkled and his face sallow and drawn, but my long dormant sympathy remained buried deep. He had made his bed by betraying our marriage. Now he could lie in it. Let her get her things, mother, he said tiredly, avoiding my accusatory stare. Might as well avoid another scene. Marlene huffed in annoyance but remained stubbornly blocking the doorway. Sighing, I shouldered past her roughly. Her affronted gasp followed me as I stormed down the hallway to the locked study. Fishing the key from my bag with trembling fingers, I shoved it in the lock vindictively. As expected, the study was in complete disarray. Papers scattered, drawers hanging open haphazardly, remnants of my missing belongings strewn across the floor. I spotted my laptop under a chair and quickly stashed it in my bag. As I turned to leave I paused, struck by the chaotic sight. Something wasn't adding up. Marlene's packed suitcases, this ransacked room. It hinted at something much darker lurking beneath the surface. I slowly circled the room, taking in details that eluded me during my angry packing frenzy yesterday. Bank statements and unopened bills littered the floor alongside flashy jewelry store receipts. My investigator's instincts, dormant since my divorce attorney days, switched on. Methodically sorting through the paper trails, a shocking narrative emerged. Excessive spending well beyond our means, fact panicked credit card applications clearly denied, final foreclosure warnings from the bank. Rocking back on my heels, I struggled to absorb this new reality on top of yesterday's revelations. Not only had Theo betrayed our marriage, but his reckless spending had torpedoed us into financial ruin without my knowledge. No wonder Marlene was so desperate to cast me out of her perfect palace. Clutching the damning evidence to my chest, I strode out of the study with newfound purpose. Theo and Marlene had played me for a fool, manipulating me like their own personal puppet. But the show was over. This victim had found her voice, and there would be hell to pay. Armed with the damning evidence tucked securely in my bag, I strode towards the front door with righteous fury pumping through my veins. 
Theo and Marlene had treated me like a disposable pawn for too long. Now it was time for their despicable web of lies to come crashing down. Marlene blocked my way as I tried to storm past, her talon-like nails digging into my forearm. Just where do you think you're going with those private documents? She hissed. I wrenched my arm free, getting right in her pinched face. First, don't ever touch me again. Second, your financial records stopped being private when you used my name to take out massive loans. I'm taking this evidence and contacting my divorce lawyer. Theo rushed over, his tired eyes wide with panic. Alara, please, be reasonable. We're undergoing a temporary cash flow issue, that's all. Mother has already made arrangements to cover it. His platitudes only stoked my rage hotter. Oh, so pilfering my personal accounts without consent and racking up secret credit card debt constitutes just a minor issue in your book? I scoffed bitterly. I saw the denied applications and final foreclosure notices, Theo. Your lies stop here. Theo paled while Marlene's painted lips flattened into a hard line, her beady eyes shooting daggers. I almost laughed at how the perfectly coiffed vulture resembled a ruffled hen with her feathers in a bunch. You clearly don't grasp the gravity of this situation, Marlene bit out. My son is facing financial ruin if word of this gets out. Is dragging our family name through the mud really necessary just to satisfy some petty revenge fantasy? Red-hot anger licked through my veins. This woman dared insinuate I would invent financial crime just for revenge? Before I could retort, she charged on, clutching Theo close to her bony chest. All my son did was try to maintain a lifestyle you eagerly enjoyed the fruits of for years. And how do you repay that generosity? By exposing his understandable missteps to bring us all down out of spite. Theo gently extricated himself from her claw-like grip. Alara has a right to be upset, mother, he said tiredly, still refusing to meet my eyes. I should have been honest about our situation from the start. I crossed my arms, unswayed by his half-hearted display of accountability. Well, it's too little, too late for that now. I'm contacting my lawyer this afternoon to file for divorce. And I won't hesitate to disclose evidence of fraud. Marlene's bony hand flew to her throat dramatically, while Theo slumped against the wall. For all their pretenses of power and control, one whiff of consequences had them quaking in their expensive Italian leather shoes. Pathetic. I stepped forward until only inches separated me from Marlene's wild eyes. Here are your options. You can contest the divorce and force this evidence into public record, destroying what remains of your family name and fortune. The or you can sign the papers, providing me a reasonable settlement, and pray I show mercy by staying silent. I strode away, heels clicking crisply on the polished floors. At the front door I paused without turning around. You have twenty-four hours to decide. Choose wisely. The heavy oak door slammed behind me with an air of finality. I slid behind the wheel of my car, hands shaking as I cranked the engine. Now that my adrenaline was fading, the gravity of what just happened sank in. I had confronted my deceitful husband and manipulative mother-in-law head-on and instead of playing the victim as they expected, I had seized control and dictated the terms going forward. No more cowering or shrinking myself to fit their twisted expectations. The doormat they had trampled on so gleefully was finally demanding respect. As I pulled through the imposing gates onto the quiet suburban street, I caught a glimpse of Hugo's plushy face peeking through the back windshield. My breath hitched in my throat, in the chaos of that toxic household, I had nearly forgotten about my sweet tabby. An unfamiliar sensation pricked behind my eyelids. I swiped at them fiercely as I accelerated down the tree-lined road. How could I have left my loyal companion, my sole source of comfort during many lonely nights, alone with those monsters? What kind of guardian abandons her defenseless kitty like that? My hands clenched the wheel tightly. Enough second-guessing myself. There would be plenty of time for regret later. Right now, I needed to focus and stick to the plan. I would wrap up my affairs quickly and efficiently before setting us both free from this toxic situation. Soon, sweet Hugo and I would be far away, starting fresh in a place where no one knew our names. Just a woman and her cat against the world. Terrifying, yes. But anything seemed better than staying trapped in this twisted web of betrayal and lies. Two weeks had passed since I stormed out of Theo and Marlene's den of lies. 
In that time, I had booked us two one-way tickets far away from this town and its superficial social scene, somewhere I could remake myself without judgmental eyes tracking my every move. The divorce was progressing rapidly now that Theo had acquiesced to my demands, perhaps hoping I would show mercy if he played nicely. But I harbored no misguided sympathy for the man who had deceived and used me for years. His pleas for another chance now rang hollow when I reflected on all the nights I had cried myself to sleep, wondering what I did wrong, why I couldn't get pregnant, no matter how hard we tried. At least I found grim satisfaction in witnessing his empire of lies crumble. Without my financial contributions and social connections, Theo's business deals rapidly dried up. Under scrutiny from investors about some accounting discrepancies, his scheming mother was booted from the board of directors, losing her seat of domineering power. She had always prioritized profits over ethics. Now, with their dirty laundry aired like musty old sheets, the Jennings name attracted only wary side-eyes and hushed gossip instead of envy. Good riddance. Let the vultures circle and the wolves descend. They made this bed. Now they could lie in the ruins that remained. The day before my departure, I found myself reluctantly driving past the cul-de-sac that once led to such a grand house of lies. Grim satisfaction flooded me at the sight of the imposing wrought-iron gates now obstructed with somber eviction signs rather than luxurious gardens. But peering closer, I spotted an elderly woman lingering alone with her suitcase on the sidewalk, wildly dialing some number. As she turned, recognition slammed me in the gut. Marlene's once commanding presence had diminished into a frail, defeated shell of her former self. Her arrogance had crumpled alongside the financial empire she was so proud of. An uncomfortable twinge stirred in my chest before I quashed it down. I owed that woman nothing, least of all my pity or sympathy. Her own ruthless ambition had led her here. I intend to drive on, leaving Marlene surrounded by the ruins of everything her vile plots had built. But Hugo meowed loudly gazing back with imploring eyes. Cursing myself for a soft-hearted fool, I pulled to the curb and lowered the passenger window. "'Do you need some help?' I asked baldly, still unwilling to show warmth, despite her circumstances. Marlene started at my voice before gathering herself hurriedly. "'We had to vacate the premises so the bank could take inventory for auction,' she said stiffly. I sighed. Even now, unable to ask for help outright. "'Do you need a ride somewhere?' Her fingers fidgeted with her ostentatious wedding ring, the impressive diamonds now looking gaudy and excessive. I was meant to stay with my cousin Gerald for the time being, but it appears his hospitality has expired. My mouth flattened into a thin line. Even her own family was fed up dealing with the fallout from her machinations. And Theo clearly wasn't around to handle his discarded mess of a mother. Another impatient meow decided me. Put your bag in the back next to Hugo. You can stay with me until you figure something else out. Surprise flickered across her tight features. That is quite an unexpected gesture after, well, everything. I shrugged, unwilling to rehash the past. I'm leaving town tomorrow anyway. Consider us temporary roommates. I left the implied time frame of 24 hours or less hanging between us. The drive to my tiny rental passed in silence until we pulled into the faded lot. Marlene took in the cracked paint and missing shingles with thinly veiled distaste. It has a certain rustic charm, she ventured half-heartedly before following me inside. I busied myself pouring food for Hugo, who had taken an immediate liking to our new houseguest. Meanwhile, Marlene lingered awkwardly before perching on the very edge of the couch. Our forced intimacy felt surreal after over a decade of cold disregard from both sides. As we picked at leftover takeout later on, polite strains of conversation gave way to candid reflections about the future, prompted perhaps by the bottle of wine I dug up. I discovered Marlene's dream of teaching music one day. In turn, I confessed my burning desire to move somewhere warm and sunny, far removed from the Illumina social fishbowl, to take up gardening. For a few strange hours, we were just two souls making sense of life's wreckage minus the history of wounds and grudges between us. But the wine eventually dwindled along with our stilted camaraderie. As we turned in for the night, tomorrow's uncertainties settled back upon us like a leaden weight. I jolted awake the next morning, momentarily forgetting about my unexpected houseguest. The aroma of freshly brewed coffee drew me out to the cramped kitchenette. 
Marlene stood rigidly by the ancient stove, wisps of gray hair escaping her normally immaculate updo. I hope you don't mind me taking the liberty of preparing breakfast, she said uncertainly. I shrugged, accepting the proffered mug. Thanks. I'm not much of a cook anyway. As we ate yogurt and granola in awkward silence, I mulled over this surreal situation. Just yesterday, Marlene was an iconic socialite. Today she was humbled and adrift, taking refuge in my modest rental. Fate certainly loved poetic twists, the haughty queen dethroned and dependent on a princess she had scorned for years. I couldn't deny feeling a slight buzz of schadenfreude watching Marlene in yesterday's rumpled Chanel grimus at the dated avocado appliances. I cleared our dishes brusquely, anxious to escape this strange familiarity. Marlene lingered at the table, gnawing her lip. Have you given any thought to what comes next, after? Her unspoken words hung heavy between us. After she left here. After I moved away to start fresh. After the final guillotine blade of divorce severed me from the only life I'd known for twelve years. I scrubbed the plates harder, avoiding her piercing gaze as I pretended fascination with a bit of stuck egg. The truth was I actively resisted peering too far down the lonely road of singlehood stretching before me. Despite everything, searing pain gripped my heart, imagining never seeing Theo's crooked smile first thing in the morning, or hearing his off-key singing in the shower. Through betrayal and deception, parts of me still clung to the comforting refuge of us. Of course, I couldn't confess these weak sentiments to Marlene. Clearing my throat roughly, I turned to face her with forced conviction. I have a flight booked to Arizona for later today. Once there, I'll start job hunting so I can afford a small place just for me and Hugo. My voice hitched slightly over our names. Eventually, I might even try dating again, but for now, it's enough to just live simply without toxic people around. I expected Marlene to flinch at the thinly veiled barb. Instead, her eyes softened with what looked strangely like empathy. The future is often murkier than our best-laid plans anticipate, she said slowly. Perhaps if I had adopted your openness to unexpected possibilities years ago, things would have played out quite differently. I raised a skeptical eyebrow, certain this was a transparent attempt to diminish her culpability. But Marlene raised a staying hand. You owe me nothing, least of all an audience for my regrets. Suffice it to say that pride and fear of vulnerability blinded me to what truly mattered until it was too late. She glanced down, blinking rapidly, while I shifted awkwardly. I had steeled myself to confront Marlene's haughty indifference once more, only to be thrown by this display of humility. But I hesitantly filled the silence, voicing a question that had plagued me for years. Why did you dislike me so intensely from the beginning? I tried everything to win your approval and make Theo happy. My voice cracked pathetically on his name, so much for indifference. Marlene seemed to fold into herself, and for the first time I glimpsed hints of a heavy burden weighing down her ramrod posture. You represented warmth, spontaneity, sincerity, everything I lost touch with long ago in my quest for the perfect family image. She gazed out the dingy window. Rather than inspire me to reconnect with life's joys, your vibrancy only magnified my own isolation so I sought to diminish what I envied. Her poignant confession landed between us with the weight of a thrown gauntlet, unexpected but impossible to ignore. I sank slowly onto a creaking chair, shoulders slumping, too exhausted to even summon anger over so many wasted years chained to her warped insecurities and judgments. Perhaps sensing my fatigue, Marlene lightly touched my shoulder. The past can't be altered, but the future awaits whatever we choose to carry forward, or leave behind. With that enigmatic remark, she quietly retreated to the bathroom, granting me space to process this overdue revelation. Through the dingy window, I glimpsed my car stuffed with two lives haphazardly thrown together, aiming only for distance from the ruins of experience. Gathering courage, I whispered a promise, one life I could still get right. I zipped my bulging suitcase with finality, scanning the cramped room for any last-minute items. Today was an ending, the closing of a chapter filled with betrayal, heartbreak, and finally empowerment. Soon Marlene and I would part ways at the airport to embark on uncertain futures that no longer involved the toxic Jennifer men. Marlene perched elegantly on the sagging sofa, though her normal perfectly pressed attire was rumpled after a night on the lumpy pullout.
I hesitated, feeling I should say something, but uncertain where we stood after last night's emotional conversation. Before the awkward silence could stretch too long, my cell phone lit up with Theo's handsome face. Still conflicted over seeing his smile every day in my photos, I silenced the call. I owed him nothing more, especially on my last day in this godforsaken town. Let me guess, another pathetic plea for reconciliation? Marlene asked dryly. When I nodded tersely, her mouth flattened into a hard line. Clearly the consequences of his abhorrent behavior haven't fully penetrated that thick skull yet if he believes sweet words can erase the past. I bristled slightly at her criticism. Theo cheating didn't negate over a decade together when I still sometimes slipped and thought of him as my partner rather than soon-to-be ex. Sensing my hesitation, Marlene leaned forward, eyes flashing. Elara, listen to me. Men like Theodore never change. They simply find new victims once the current one finally resists being used and lied to. You deserve so much better, and I won't have you throwing away this fresh start because of some misplaced longing for a man incapable of valuing your beautiful spirit. Her passion threw me. Marlene despised vulnerability, preferring to manipulate scenarios from behind the scenes. This fierce display revealed glimpses of the motherly protector she kept buried beneath ambition and stone-faced control. Seeing warmth emanating from someone I had long dismissed as an icy villain both rattled and touched me. Rather than grapple with complex feelings, I straightened briskly and reached for my suitcase. We should get going. I still need to drop you at the airport. The drive passed swiftly as we purposefully avoided tender topics or future plans. But pulling up to the terminal's bustling curb, melancholy still permeated the cramped space. Our paths were unlikely to ever cross again after today. Nostalgia flickered briefly for the friends we could have been under different circumstances before I quashed it down. No point getting mired in fruitless what-ifs. I climbed out and retrieved her small bag from the back seat. Facing each other squarely for likely the last time, echoes of the past hovered ghostly between us. Years of rivalry and resentment now faded into exhaustion and regret in the light of present upheaval. Surprising us both, I stepped forward and briefly hugged Marlene's fragile frame, feeling sharp shoulder blades under my palms. She squeezed back tightly for a breath before drawing up sternly, lips quivering slightly. With a mute nod that conveyed volumes, she walked briskly through the sliding doors without a backward glance. Watching her departure, I exhaled slowly, unexpectedly feeling lighter and oddly at peace. The bitter old vulture had faced her long overdue reckoning, but the broken woman moving cautiously into an uncertain future now seemed unshackled from former bonds of perfectionism. I lingered a few moments more in the idling car, staring sightlessly across the bustling lanes of traffic. Then Hugo meowed insistently from his carrier, jolting me from troubled thoughts. Our new life awaited far from this place of ghosts and shadows. After dropping Hugo at the special pet boarding area with strict personalized care instructions, I headed toward the crowded security queues. But barely twenty steps later, familiar polished loafers appeared in my peripheral vision. I halted abruptly, heart pounding. How dare he ambush me here when I had made my wishes for no contact perfectly clear? I pivoted slowly to face Theo, taking savage satisfaction as his innately poised countenance wavered under my blistering glare. The weeks following my departure had clearly taken their toll. His Armani suit, hung loosely off a gaunt frame and stubble, peppered his normally smooth jaw. But I staunchly barricaded any softening behind bitter memories of his callous betrayals. Drawing myself up rigidly, I brushed past him without a word, refusing to indulge this confrontation or be manipulated yet again by his excuses and platitudes. But his hand gently caught my wrist, halting my furious momentum. Alara, please wait. I know you owe me nothing after how despicably I acted. But we meant too much once for it to end this bitterly without closure. Just hear me out, and then I'll accept whatever choice you make. I wavered. His simple dignity contrasted starkly with prior vigorous denials. Sensing my hesitation, Theo guided us gently to an empty waiting area, his familiar earthy scent briefly distracting, before I caught myself leaning closer instinctively. No more damning self-deceptions. I would hear him out. But my erstwhile prince had forever forfeited the privilege of my trust. 
settling reluctantly across from him, I crossed my arms and waited. Theo fiddled with his silver wedding band, gathering courage under my expectant stare. When the stretching silence became unbearable, I prompted impatiently, Well, you insisted on this intrusion, so talk. He raked a hand through prematurely graying hair. You deserve the full truth about her. About everything. My nails carved crescents into my palms. That wounds were still so raw even her pronoun felt like lemon juice highlighted my pathetic inability to move on fully. Sensing my lingering fragility, Theo's eyes softened. Alara, she never mattered. Not like you. It was just a stupid conquest to feel young again with too much booze and flattering attention. I cut him off sharply. Your asinine midlife crisis doesn't justify the deliberate choosing of infidelity. You squandered precious years we can't recover. My voice broke on the last word. You're completely right. Nothing forgives what I did. Theo stared beseechingly into my eyes, but hardest to admit has been facing the underlying reason this recklessness felt so compelling. He took a shuddering breath. I was terrified of truly being there for you emotionally after the last miscarriage. Easier to escape into late nights at bars rather than wrestle with feeling like a failure as your husband. Unwelcome sympathy pricked my conscience, hearing the depth hearing the depth of his private demons before I set my jaw firmly. His weakness didn't exonerate deeply scarring betrayal. Sensing he hadn't earned the right to my absolution yet, Theo leaned forward urgently. That day you collapsed in the foyer. I ignored ten panicked messages from Julian to jet off with her instead. What kind of man abandons his wife unconscious and bleeding? His broad shoulders shook with rare vulnerable emotion. The affair ended that very night once guilt overruled the thrill of pretended escape, at but like a coward I just doubled down on secrets instead of confessing. Despite myself, hot tears trailed down my face at the excruciating image. Seeing my distress, he cautiously extended a tentative hand. When I didn't pull away, he enveloped my icy fingers in consoling warmth. Alara Jennings, you have been my steadfast anchor through lost jobs, family deaths, all of it. His thumbs gently traced my knuckles. I destroyed everything good through my own weakness in failing you, and no words can ever heal that pain. He squeezed my hands softly, meeting my eyes with heartbreaking sincerity. I just needed you to know your immeasurable worth before our paths diverge for good. I stared sightlessly over his shoulder, struggling desperately to shore up crumbling defenses against this tender onslaught. But Theo misinterpreted my silence and withdrew hastily. Forgive my selfishness keeping you any longer. I wish you all the joy and peace going forward that you deserve. He made to stand before I gave in to the magnetic pull I had resisted for endless lonely weeks and grabbed his wrist wordlessly. Our joined hands spoke of lingering ghosts not fully exercised, despite determined intentions to walk away whole and healed. Come with me to grab lunch before my flight, I whispered hoarsely. We both could use the company. His eyes lit up with notes of irrepressible hope that caught traitorously in my weary heart. We meandered slowly through garishly lit terminals with hands loosely linked, the familiar intimacy both comforting and piercing, after so many silent nights strangling on angry tears into my pillow. As we dwelled in this peaceful eye in the storm of separation, I dared acknowledge how perfectly our hands still fit together, if only for a few stolen moments more. But crossing the bustling departure hall, reality intruded as my terminal flashed insistently on the screen above. I lingered reluctantly, clutching these final grains of before slipped away forever. With strength that surprised us both, I embraced him fiercely, conveying wordlessly echoes of grief over wrecked dreams and forgiveness still under construction. His lips grazed my hair, landing feather light like a blessing. Walk forward in hope, Theo whispered. Eyes suspiciously bright, he stepped back and raised a hand in silent farewell. I strode steadily to the boarding gate without glancing backward, but as the plane engines roared to life, I pressed my palm against the window, imagining his steadfast silhouette waiting below until distance rendered us strangers once more. I gazed out the dingy bus window as the California desert peeled back, revealing saguaro-dotted vistas under cerulean skies. The burning Golden State sun was just setting behind craggy red peaks. I smiled softly, 
feeling possibilities stirring within me, like those hardy wildflowers I spotted blanketed alongside the highway, narrowly avoiding the brown desolation. This faded greyhound was miles removed from the privileged illusion of my former life, when spontaneous weekend getaways meant booking a lavish resort suite on Theo's black card, rather than dozing upright with questionable stains on ripped vinyl seats. Yet I had never felt freer than with the wind whipping through cracked windows as I hugged a worn postcard with a hastily circled apartment listing. The ad I had obsessively memorized was for a cozy one-bedroom casita on the outskirts of Tucson, backing up to saguaro forests and sun-baked trails. Affording the $750 monthly rent would require relying on spousal support payments from Theo for a little while longer until I found reliable work. I knew without asking Marlene was getting by on similar temporary lifeboats, whatever settlements our lawyers had wrangled from the former Jennings empire. Pride would just have to cope with necessities for now. My impulsive liberation from toxic security had to transcend fear-based decision-making. I refused to settle in meaningless jobs just for the paycheck. I craved space to rediscover my passions. As the cramped bus navigated the narrow, dusty streets of downtown Tucson after nightfall, I peered out searching for familiar landmarks from the online listing. My eager gaze soon spotted the carved oak tree dead ahead marking my destination. I quickly tugged my worn duffels down, jostling bleary passengers. Scooping up a yowling Hugo, I murmured excitedly to him as we stepped off onto the cracked sidewalk breathing in creosote and sage-scented air. The promised carved oak stood proudly between two squat adobe homes, seemingly melded with the desert itself. My new neighbor kept a cozy, handcrafted wind chime dangling from gnarled branches that tinkled cheerfully in the warm breeze. Further down the dusty street, lights still burned cozily in low windows as families finished evening meals, faint laughter, and barked dogs echoing through the sleepy neighborhood. Drawing courage from such warm domesticity, I marched up to the small mustard-yellow duplex tucked privately in back, flowers overflowing from rusted barrels flanking the turquoise door. My new landlady, Sylvia, emerged at the sound of gravel crunching under my feet, her deeply lined and weathered face cracking into a brilliant welcoming smile. Dried lavender sprigs woven through thin braids spilled across her faded peasant blouse as she drew me into an unexpected embrace, redolent of sweet sage and cornmeal. Alara, so wonderful you made it safe, dear heart. Don't be shy now. Come in, come in. I have your unit all ready for occupants big and small. Her musical voice held echoes of the multicultural Southwest as she scooped up Hugo and cooed nonsense sounds at him. My anxious shoulders relaxed at her easy affection, and within fifteen minutes, all my earthly belongings were tucked cozily into the lovingly decorated one bedroom overlooking fragrant flowering bushes alive with birds. Sylvia proudly demonstrated the shiny oven and gurgling fridge she had picked, picked up secondhand, especially with me in mind, before stuffing my hands with homemade tamales and departing with another fierce hug. Alone in the tiny haven, emotion swamped me as I sunk down on the quilted sofa staring sightlessly at azure walls and the vibrant paintings adorning them. After so many years existing elegantly in Marlene's cold shadow, I was finally home, somewhere that felt utterly mine alone to nurture growth rather than shrink small for approval. I didn't bother fighting grateful tears, let them flow freely to cleanse old wounds so something fresh and resilient could take root. Even Theo's framed face smiling down from my bedside table no longer constricted my heart as it once had. Simply a bittersweet reminder that seasons change, but the essence of who we are remains if we nurture truth within. Curled under a faded quilt watching the moon rise with Hugo purring softly beside me, I made a silent pledge. Never again would anyone dictate my worth or potential. I was finally choosing to live rather than just survive. To embrace life's messy evolution on my own terms, with arms flung open wide. Tomorrow's unknowns no longer sparked fear, but rather anticipation, blooming brightly like those desert wildflowers daring to blossom against adversity. Tonight, I simply rested in my decision to thrive freely under boundless western skies, ready to greet a new dawn.